Before we dive into today's insightful discussion, I want to share some updates that will enhance your FemPower Health experience. We're excited to launch our new interactive newsletter. This weekly newsletter is packed with the latest scientific findings, business insights, and essential updates in the realm of women's health. Signing up is easy. Just visit our website or click the link in the show notes. Our website is also a comprehensive resource organized by topic for your convenience. Whether you're delving into the latest research, exploring any trends in healthcare, or seeking information in specific health topics, it's all there at your fingertips. Additionally, for our Spotify users, we've created playlists categorized by these topics, offering you another way to stay informed and engaged. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, while we can't categorize content within the app, our website remains a central hub for all of these resources. And be sure to take advantage of these tools to stay on top of the evolving world of women's health, science, and business. Now let's get started with today's episode. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. It's a highly hereditary and it's a neurological difference. In other words, uh, we can see it on scans of the brain, how, how ADHD brains are different. This difference is very, very sensitive to its environment. Welcome to FemPower Health. Georgie here. ADHD impacts millions of Americans, and there's so much discussion around this, including whether or not you should be on medication. What about adult onset ADHD? Are there natural ways to treat ADHD? What can parents do? What can adults do? Is this really a thing? So today I am pleased to help answer some of these questions with Dr. Tamara Rossier, and she is the founder of the ADHD Center of West Michigan, leading a team of coaches, therapists, and speech pathologists to help individuals, parents, and families develop an understanding and learn effective skills to live with ADHD effectively. And she is also the author of the book, Your Brain's Not Broken. So take a listen because her book is incredible and it provides such a great framework for dealing with ADHD. And so what I decided to do is spend time talking to her about the things that aren't in the book but the questions that are on everyone's. So take a listen. And I truly hope that this episode helps you and your loved ones. Your book is amazing. Like when I researched, I might've sent this in the email to you. I really wanted to do a lot more this upcoming season on mental health. And, you know, ADHD has been discussed I research the books, and if I don't know a topic, I tend to find an author. And then I research the heck out of that author because the reviews, I don't look at, is it five stars, four stars? I look at what do the reviews say? And your book by Leaps and Bounds was the best reviewed. Your book is incredible. It is such a great how-to guide. Quite honestly, I saw myself in this book 
which is starting to help put pieces together that I never knew my whole life. So that's why, like, there was a point where I actually started crying. (laughs) I was like, oh my God. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for writing this book, because I think it's going to help a lot of people. I just want you to know that means the world to me because I really wrote this book sort of as a a love letter to people um, so that they could stop being mad at themselves all the time. It means a lot to me that you had that experience. So thank you. It's amazing. Um, And I will say on my social media, I posted, all I did was say, what are your questions? Wow. (laughs) Even people's questions created commentary. So it was really interesting how important of a discussion this is. And I do want to preface that what I tend to do, especially with authors, is people can read your book. I want to talk about what's not in the book. And we will obviously cover the themes of what's in your book, but I can tell by the way it's written and the questions that are out there about ADHD, I I really want to go a bit deeper and have those hard conversations that I think people are having offline anyways, and I'd like to bring them to the forefront. So why don't you start out by telling us who you are and why you wrote this amazing book. And then we'll dive right into the questions. Yeah. You know, I started ADHD coaching about 10 years ago. This is before I opened up the ADHD Center of West Michigan. But I was having the same conversation with my clients again and again. They would come to me and they were just so frustrated with who they were. And each time, um, you know, I would do the coaching, I would listen, I would help them come to their own solutions. But at the end of each session, I just wanted to tell each of them, hey, your brain's not broken. It's just different. That's kind of where the book came from. Uh, The impetus to write the book was, (laughs) as with so many things, I got fed up with what was out there because no one was talking about the emotional dysregulation that comes along with ADHD. And so I thought, well, darn it, someone needs to tell people that there is a whole emotional component to having ADHD. So first of all, the whole name of ADHD is a misnomer. I think in about five years, we're going to see it renamed um, because we don't have attention deficit. We have too much attention disease. Um, And I'm being silly when I call it a disease. There's two big camps in the ADHD world. And when you look at the symptoms of ADHD, right, we have impaired short-term memory. Uh, We have uh, lesser uh, working memory. And those are the things that kind of our society thinks are smart, right? Can you get to someplace on time? Can you do these tasks in order? Sequencing is also an issue for those of us with ADHD. And so... I really spent a lot of my adulthood just wondering, I must be really dumb. Now, you'd say, okay, is that true because you have a PhD? Well, yeah, but I explained it like any good ADHD person would. Well, that's just luck and hard work, right? So I explained a lot of it away because I didn't understand my ADHD. I opened up the ADHD center and started coaching And I really started to see a lot of people who were truly just angry at themselves for not doing better. A lot of them just really have hard lives because having ADHD is difficult. So I wrote that book because I wanted people to understand one, having ADHD, it's not a, it's not a funny punchline. It's actually something that's a grown up diagnosis and it makes living in the modern world harder. I also wanted them to know that there is a serious emotional connection, um, especially emotional dysregulation, connection to ADHD. There's this concern, and I ask about prevalence because one, it's there's a concern right now, and even on my feed, all the questions were about medication. People were like, I want natural instead, defending medication, you name it. Some people, like you said, throw it around like it's candy, you know, they, they, you know, offhand make comments about ADHD. Um, 
also too, when you look at neurodiversity in general, one can have, you know, different like autism and other things. And so is it a spectrum? We have increased screen time. And so is that making things worse? Is it that we have the internet now? So there's more awareness. And I know this is not like the easiest question to answer. So this is not meant to be a quiz, but more like, where are we with our understanding of ADHD and and how prevalent it actually is? You know, in the early 1800s is is when we have physicians starting to know, wow, there's something different about these students because it was not a void disease at first, right? I personally can trace ADHD back in my family three generations. Now I'm piecing together together anecdotes, but I'm pretty sure I can um, at least trace it to my grandfather, um, but I can trace it to his. So ADHD is highly hereditary. And it's a neurological difference. And so when we frame it as it's not necessarily a disorder, it's a neurological difference. Now, I have a bias that it's a neurological difference that makes living in the modern world more difficult, which is why it's being assessed more. Uh, My grandfather, he was born in 1913, and he lived in what we call in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula. It's that little part of land hanging off of Michigan. And his dad uh, was an immigrant and was a minor. And my grandfather, who happened to be ADHD and left-handed, which was a big, big problem back in those days, he dropped out of school when he was in sixth grade to go work in the mines, in the copper mines. Now, because he wasn't, quote, book smart. Now, he actually was quite smart because he ended up moving to Grand Rapids, Michigan, teaching himself how to be an engineer. Because, you know, back in those days, you could teach yourself to be an engineer. OSHA wasn't a thing. Um, And so he ended up being an engineer at American Seating. That is kind of an ADHD story of the 1900s. It's it's a lot of smart people who were self-made because they weren't book smart. But now we're living in a different world. And the modern world really is more difficult um, because, you know, really not being book smart isn't really a great option, right? You can't just call yourself an engineer if you didn't go to college. You can't get a job as an engineer. And so you really have to kind of have these degrees to back yourself up. Now let's add social communication. Social communication, which we know, those of us with ADHD, it's not that we're lagging behind, not that we don't have social. We tend to have more emotions that we bring to social situations. And now when you have social situations that are very complex, that is incredibly draining for the ADHD person. Um, So in every way possible, the modern world is so challenging to be ADHD. Um, I say with, uh, to some of my clients, I'm like, you know what? If you could just go live on that deserted island and just fend for yourself, and they always finish the sentence, oh, I'd be nailing life because it's simple. Um, By the way, ADHD folks, a lot of us have, and we don't understand the research of this. We just know that it is. There's something about being in nature that calms down our brains and helps us to actually think better. We don't know why, we just know that it is right now. It makes so much sense. Like for me, you know what my son and I do now? Hiking. We take, yes. and, and also camping. We take week, uh, now all of our vacations are going to a national park. Transformative. Oh, I got I got chills because that's what you're doing. It is transformative for the ADHD brain. And so never in life have we lived so far removed from nature as a society. The The prevalence is, I think we're seeing it more and more. Because this neurological difference has always been with us, but it hasn't been as pronounced as a problem. And it's a huge problem. Frankly, those of us with ADHD, we're at risk of not doing as well as our neurotypical peers. Before anyone fights me on that, let me just explain the research. 
the research is pretty clear. What neurotypicals, those without ADHD, have more of, we tend to have less of. So happier marriages, money, satisfying careers. What neurotypicals have less of, we tend to have more of. Heart disease, diabetes, we tend to live 13 years less than our, our neurotypical counterparts. Yeah, that was sobering research. I, I decided not to think too long on that one. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Teen pregnancy, um, car accidents. This is a serious um, thing that we need to be looking at. And so I, a lot of my clients are having a hard time getting their ADHD meds. There's a shortage on that. Uh, listen, our ADHD meds make us perform at a normal rate. They don't get us high. We're not addicted to them. It just makes me look a little bit more normal. This whole question, and I'll just list them because it's probably easier to talk about this holistically. There's extracurricular activities and how they might contribute. Diet, natural approaches, gender and ADHD, which we might want to talk about separately. And the different types of meds like Endeavor RX, someone was specifically asking about that one. And so there was this whole mix of meds or no meds, plus all these other things to do. And people were very defensive if they were on meds. And those who were scared of like, especially kids being on meds were like, can we find another way? And so that seemed to be this view of if I'm on it, it's such a great benefit. Why can't you just get it? If a young person's yep. on it, why can't they stop being on it? So that seemed to be the polarizing viewpoint. But again, there's all these other solutions people had asked about. Let's start with is this on a continual? And ADHD is on a continual. And so really, I look, I start to look at how badly is it interfering with your life? And let's think about the eight-year-old little boy who comes home from school and goes, mom, I just know I'm stupid. I hate myself so much. Well, that tells me that he probably needs medication because that little guy is working as hard as he knows how, and he can't regulate his brain. And he's using his little, he's using his little brain to go, I don't know how to concoct anything else but to say, I absolutely hate myself. And at that point, I'll say to parents, please consider medication. Because this little guy, he's doing everything. You're feeding him right. You're exercising him right because ADHD kids need exercise just like dogs do. If you're exercising, you're doing everything, but he still can't manage it. And so in that case, I would say, yeah, seriously, look at it. Um, I work with a surgeon and he is not medicated. He's obviously extremely intelligent and he has a whole bunch of people around him to manage his ADHD. He doesn't need to be medicated. So we look at the severity. We look at how it's really mucking with your daily function. I am very particular about how I manage my ADHD. I like my brain. I'm working on my next book. So I, I'm always, uh, exercise, by the way, is one of the best things you can do for ADHD, but I'm watching what I eat. Uh, I know that too much sugar for me is going to mess with my symptoms. I watch when my medication's wearing off. And I, I, I really closely monitor all my symptoms because I want to be a high performing engine. Some people are like, yeah, I don't need to perform that high. I'm fine. And so we want to go and meet the symptoms that are kind of resolve the symptoms that you want to resolve. And so whether or not you use medication, um, please, I just, a note to your listeners, don't beat down people who've chosen medication. Don't beat down people who haven't. We're all just trying to figure this thing out. And there is not a right way. With one little caveat, when it gets to children, if you have a young driver, especially a male, and they have pretty severe ADHD, I personally would medicate because that driver is at risk for himself and others. The research on that is just incredibly clear. So that's one population that I would just start to pay attention to um, is, especially if you have a teen, very symptomatic, I would watch their risk-taking behaviors. So what I'm hearing so far is meds when needed, 
I even was, it was interesting in your book, you also said that it's like, when I, I take prescriptions, it's like, okay, at 6.30 every night. And it sounded like you could also, with these meds, take them as needed. Uh, stimulants work for 80% of us. And so for 80%, if you just give us a stimulant, uh, it could be Ritalin, Concerta, Vyvanse, whatever, it just helps um, us regulate our dopamine production. Well, as that declines over the evening, um, we have this like strange gap and I call it the witching hour. A lot of us call it the witching hour because it's when we're kind of the, the medication that, that kind of clear mindedness is leaving. All the thoughts are coming rushing back like a tidal wave. And, and that's really sort of difficult, especially if we're not ready to wrap up the day. So some of us at 3 p.m., uh, 4 p.m. will take a booster to get us through to 7 p.m. So there was a question about, are we unnecessarily trying so hard to put things into buckets and label them? And the person said, yeah, my son was diagnosed and meds were not recommended. So I was like, whatever. I took the diagnosis off the evaluation because it opened up stereotypes and liabilities. And the testing also made me realize that I have it and I think I've learned to compensate. But when there was too much on my plate, I collapsed. I've done this certain job where it has helped me organize my thoughts and it appealed to higher order thinking. And it's been incredible. And I look at a number of people who are self-diagnosed as a result of technology. I'm convinced we're headed to a twitchy neurotic society where only people who have the patience to deal with tiny boxes and forms can succeed. A little strong, but when you're frustrated, um, that's what you're going to say. And so, you know, my takeaway from this is, you know, there's typical and neurodiverse and within neurodiversity right now, we're talking about ADHD. So the flip side of this is, are we just viewing this all wrong? And there's just different types of people and we're trying so hard to put it in this typical versus neurodiverse and trying to segment the population instead of just accepting that we're all different and have ways to contribute. And I'm not at all saying we shouldn't right. diagnose ADHD because clearly there are things that need to be done to support people. But how far are we going? Because there are all these things now that seem to be contributing to a lot of factors, as you mentioned, in this modern day society. So I think it's just such an important thing that I'd love to get your thoughts on. So I, I have big thoughts on this. Again, those two camps that think, oh, ADHD, it's, it's a disorder, it's a disability. And then you have the other camp of going, no, 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 it's a gift. I love my ADHD. Uh, I was talking to someone today and she's like, I love my ADHD. I'm like, right, but you don't have to be married to your ADHD. You're highly emotional and dysregulated and that's hard on people. And so the truth is we need to understand who we are. We need to increase the self-awareness. And ADHD is very, like, like uh, your listener wrote, is very sensitive to the environment. So if I had to do it all over again, I would have homeschooled one of my kids in a heartbeat. Um, she's 28 years old. And so homeschooling isn't, wasn't then what it is now. In a heartbeat, I would do that. I would change the environment to fit her better. I didn't really have that option back then, right? But anytime we can change the environment to fit the person, that's, that's lovely. But guess what? Not everyone has that option. And I want to be careful when I say things like that, because what about the single working mother? You know, she, didn't, she doesn't really want to be in this job right now. But guess what? This is what's making it work for her. So she's out there. She's working really hard. And if taking medication to help her accommodate to an environment that isn't well suited for her works, then we want to support that person. And so I think eventually we don't want to have the view of, um, you know, hey, ADHD doesn't matter. Uh, we want it to be, it's a true neurological difference. Let's respect that. And when we can, let's change the environment to match the person. But guess what? When, it, when we can't do that, 
then let's help the person with medication. So then what about for those with ADHD going into the world and trying to figure out, because you don't want to be like in silence because with, with being so sensitive, right? Everything is being accounted for and it's overwhelming. And so how do you help the world understand what you need in a way that's not the ADHD way? When I first started running the ADHD center and it was obvious that I had ADHD, I remember being on the sidelines and a parent made a joke at my expense. Uh, the parents were collecting money for the coach's gift. And one of the dads said, well, don't give it to Tamara. She has ADHD. Okay. I'm a grown woman and that shouldn't have hurt my feelings because that guy thought he was being funny. But a lot of us with ADHD take those hits all the time. And so for us advocating for ourselves, we kind of try to go undercover and we mask our symptoms, especially women. We tend to overfunction and mask um, what really are our ADHD symptoms. So it's, it's really difficult uh, to get the respect. I mean, I have a PhD and I feel disrespected uh, many times by neurotypicals who are well-meaning. In fact, I wrote about it in the book, like, like a really well-meaning person kind of makes a joke at, uh, at your expense. And it's fair if you go, well, Tamara, how about you toughen up? Well, yeah, but a lot of us with ADHD also have rejection sensitivity. And so it means that we really wear our emotions kind of on our sleeve and we get hurt feelings way too easily. In fact, if you ask me what I don't like about most don't like about myself is that I'm not tougher with my emotions. I wish I had more emotional toughness. And I know that's part of my ADHD. So, so part of asking ADHD people to unmask and stand up and go, oh, no, 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 hold up. I need, I need these directions in, in a written form because I have ADHD. Well, just even saying you have ADHD, she kind of opens you up to the mocking. So in an ideal world, uh, we would be confident. I have to tell you, I do have a lot of millennial clients who are smart. They know their mind. And I'm thinking of a specifically a lovely lawyer uh, with whom I worked. She was very open about her ADHD and said, hey, listen, I'm a great lawyer. I need these accommodations to do my job well. And I think she's a great example of saying, hey, this is tougher for me, um, but I, I can do this job if, if you allow me this. So that's a great example. But for a lot of us mere mortals, we're still kind of embarrassed that we have this thing called ADHD. And is that right? No. But is it our, our kind of reaction for kind of those years that we got, got kicked around? Yeah. Um, it's actually why I named the book, Your Brain's Not Broken, because I have to first convince ADHD people that their brains aren't broken. FemPower Health is pleased to partner with the upcoming FemTech and Consumer Innovation Summit. The summit is the latest deep dive event, part of the Women's Health Innovation Series, looking to tackle this growing sector of women's health, having had continental success in driving innovation, investment, research, and partnerships in traditional women's health care by bringing together critical stakeholders. Join us in New York on June 7th and 8th as we channel this success into the consumer sector of women's health. Visit www.femtechconsumerinnovation.com to view the superstar speaker lineup and enter code FEMPOWER15 for 15% off your ticket. Hope to see you there. It, it makes a lot of sense when, you know, in reading the book, just understanding some of the aspects that and I'm curious if, if others read the book, if they're like, I didn't realize I even shamed myself and they may have some new insights. So what about it, quote unquote, getting worse? Are you born with it and certain triggers bring it out? Is it that you kind of always have it and 
certain life stages make it more apparent or exacerbate it? What is this? Because you also mentioned it's hereditary. So how does this this work? Well, it's a highly hereditary and it's a neurological difference. In other words, uh, we can see it on scans of the brain, how, how ADHD brains are different. This difference is very, very sensitive to its environment. My family of origin was a drunken goat rodeo. Both parents had ADHD, neither were emotionally healthy. They were divorced. They got married young, divorced young. And so I was a child of the 70s and 80s. My whole generation, we're like feral children, right? Adults are like, yeah, go figure it out. And so I kind of grew up not understanding, like, kids were put to bed on time. Kids had regular meals. Well, that affected my ADHD, right? And so it affected um, my schoolwork. You know, everyone's like, hey, sit, sit down and do homework. Yeah, cool story, bro. I don't even know what that means, right? I didn't learn how to do homework until my junior year of college. Um, when I wasn't getting the grades I wanted, I'm like, how do I fix this? And then fortunately I had a friend who I just started to look at and went, wow, she goes to this place called the library. Now <laughs> I work with students who their parents are just like watching them, watching every move, helping them go to bed on time, getting them up. They have a desk that they work at. And so these kids tend to do better at school. Why? They have an environment that shaped them. And so even though it's a neurological difference, environment plays such a huge role in this. Um, I do want to, want to say uh, diet plays a huge role in this. Um, I think the reason why we see it more in the U.S. is our diet sucks. Um, yeah. I, it's the standard American diet is absolutely depressing. So yeah, we're making ADHD worse. Screens. Yeah. It makes ADHD worse. Exercise makes it better. Um, I know that when I avoid the, the things that I'm allergic to, by the way, a lot of us with ADHD, we have twitchy nervous systems and we're often um, overreactive to many things in our environment. We're very sensitive to the environment. So um, a lot of ADHD folks have allergies. And uh, I notice when I avoid my allergies, my ADHD symptoms aren't as bad. It's still wow. a neurological disorder, but some things exacerbate it and some things will make it. So it's still a difference. It's just how it's expressed changes. Interesting. So, um, would stress also make it worse? I would assume. I would assume. <laughs> heck yes on that. Oh, uh, yes. When I was working on my dissertation, I really went to the doctor and I said, I, I think I have dementia. Like, can you <laughs> test me? And my doctor kept saying, no, you have ADHD and are under a lot of stress. I'm like, yeah, but I'm repeating myself. I'm, I'm having conversations I don't remember having. Um, and it, it was because it was a very stressful time in my life. So, okay. um, especially women in menopause. Oh, wow. That's a whole different fiasco. And that's only now starting to be respected. And I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause I was actually going to say, I, um, it's like, again, I feel like, um, health is on a spectrum, which is why yeah. I encourage folks when they listen to FemPower Health to, or when they're researching anything really to like look at a bunch of different subjects because they all, I feel like yes. relate. It's like, where does one end and the other begin? Because exactly. I was actually going to ask you if menopause was with all the hormone changes another way. Cause I was joking with a friend of mine, we went somewhere and um, we, we joked that the tagline from our trip should be. So what'd you say again? What were we just talking about? <laughs> like we would literally have a conversation. Our kids would like run up and we're like, what were we talking about again? And so we just like, that was the whole trip. I was like, this is so bad. I, I will just share a couple of, of funny examples that like I, there were times I laughed out loud when I was reading your book. Cause I was like, oh my God, this explains. So a few, one, I bombed the SATs, bombed. I was like, if you give me, 
an essay, one question, it will be the best essay you will have ever read. The SATs, this was me taking the SATs. I would see it and I would talk myself into every single option. And in my view, all the answers could have been possibly maybe the answer. That's divergent thinking. Yes. Oh, so you had, remember the divergent thinking in the book and divergent thinking is what ADHD people do well. Everything is related when you have ADHD. So you talk about this project. Well, this is related to this and this is related to this. And (laughs) oh, well, I, I should actually be cooking right now, but you know what? I'd rather do one more coat of paint. So there's that convincing yourself that multiple choice, like, well, all of these are correct in some universe. That is an ADHD thing. So, you know, what you just described is exactly the difference that we have. We don't narrow our thinking to one right answer. We blow it up into 10, 10 trillion different answers. And, and that's kind of the definition or one definition that I use for ADHD is we rely on divergent thinking. And just for your listeners, convergent thinking is what Sherlock Holmes does. He takes all these different various um, clues and he comes up with one solution. We take one clue and blow it up into a hundred solutions. <sighs> it, it is ex- an exhausting. <laughs> Good cleansing breath there. <laughs> yes. But I agree with you on, on some of your tips like sleep. Number one it is my number one priority. Eighty she braids. Guess what? we run harder and faster if we wear out faster. And that means um, some of us need naps throughout the day. Um, Some people, if I have a very, very busy day at the office, I have a little blankie here and a little pillow and I'll go in one of the rooms and I'll just take a quick 20 minute break to recharge my brain because it takes a lot to run these ADHD brains. And the other thing is um, we know that sleep's important And yet somehow we become this little night elf creeping around our house. And we're kind of like high on that fact. Like, hee, 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 I know I should go to bed, but look what a wonderful world this is. And so um, those are two very ADHD things we have going on. And half of my job is just trying to convince ADHD adults to go to bed. I, I think you just summarized my coaching job right there. Just go to bed. So a couple of my tips, if I block my calendar for how long I think something's going to take, and then I prioritize the thing that if I, I will die if I don't, it's exaggeration. I will die if I don't get these three things done today. I try to do those first because they're usually convergent thinking things um, or tasks that I find uninteresting. And then if the things don't get done, it's okay. I move it to the next day or I move it to a different time. But that has been helping. And then starting the day, if I do not start with a walk outside or writing in my journal or reading, the rest of the day is toast. But your book gives even more tips. But um, that's that's what seems so far to be working. So I'm already using the things in your book. I, I had used them before, but not to this degree. And so thank you. Those are amazing tips. Thanks for that feedback. Here's the thing. Everyone kind of, we had to figure out what works for us and you found some things that have worked and now you know why they work you're like hey look i've got this brain that i have to kind of trick into doing the boring stuff sometimes and so i'm going to put those as my do or die list because by the way uh, we do have a flair for the dramatics those of us who have adhd I, i do love the drama so i recently left new york city and i thought i was a diehard new yorker and I, I left the city and now moved to Irvington. And in my backyard, you can go hiking. It's amazing. And I'm now wondering, based on something you said earlier, if being in a city environment with the constant lights and the people and the 5,000 things you could do in a day and the newest restaurant and the newest Broadway show, like I, I, I think that's why I was always so anxious living there. I know research-wise, there is something... And I, this is a not research word, but magical about putting ADHD people in nature. And we can define nature however you want, but something in the natural world. 
I think our tolerance for city living varies. And for me, my tolerance for city living is so low. Um, I was in Spain two weeks ago. Um, I was in Bilbao. It was lovely. I just wanted to get to the smaller, older towns because it was less stimulating, less people around me. Remember, those of us with ADHD, we have very sensitive nervous systems. And so for me, it's just constantly being near traffic, people, like different sources of energy was just exhausting for me. But I have a relatively low tolerance for that. So I think it, it is that's something that's on the continuation. Yeah. Um, I know that New York is full of ADHD people. I visited there. So I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, a lot of people will go, oh, yeah, I just love it. It's brand new, everything. And they're actually getting adrenaline from and dopamine. Uh, from living in the city, right? They they like the feeling of being alert um, and almost hyper alert and a dopamine charge. Um, it's because they have a higher tolerance for that. And so it is true about ADHD people in nature, but I think some people um, just have a different tolerance. Two, two more quick questions, if you don't mind. One is Absolutely. the term adult onset. So we talked about this being neurological. And so is it really onset or is it one, there's this continuum of life? Like I I actually made a statement yesterday and I didn't realize how much it applied here. It was like, my life kept having more challenging things happen without anything else going away. So like my mom died um, when I was younger, my dad died. Um, I had four years of fertility treatments. I got a divorce. My brother had some issues like on and on and on, Um, you know, moving, job changes, all these things. And so it was just like, I, I always felt like everything piled. And so to me, I feel like my symptoms have just gotten worse. Now I feel like I'm figuring it out, but the noise would not stop. Yes, and there was never relief, and so I'm wondering: is that kind of more what's happening? Like COVID stressors in life, more screens, more, more. So it, it's definitely not onset because we um, we're very sloppy in the in our world about language here, and so it's not adult onset. It's hey, you've been surviving so far, but guess what? the The ratio has changed where your ability to Uh, adapt is diminished. And so that's really what we're talking about. In other words, younger version of you, you're smart, you're hardworking, and you kept taking those knocks. And you're like, yep, that's okay. I'm building resilience. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And again, um, IQ is not related to ADHD, but wow, it's nice to have a healthy IQ when you do have ADHD. And so you are leaning into that. You're getting stuff done. And then menopause hits and you're like, okay, white flag. I, I'm tapping out here. I don't think I can handle it. Everyone hits the wall sometime. Um, I work with a lot of um, physicians who they start seeing me uh, during residency. If you know anything about residency, they don't get a lot of sleep. Oh, you mean one of those critical success factors of managing ADHD? Yeah, that's it. And so we all hit the wall sometime um, if the demands are too great. So it's about demand versus our capacity. Thank you. What about testing? Like, I mean, again, I I just told you I haven't been officially diagnosed, but boy, did I see myself in this book. Um, I asked for my my therapist to help me figure out if this is what I have. So she gave me this checklist and she asked my ex-husband who has you know, lived in the same house with me for a long time to also take it on my behalf. She's going to compare our notes. I will just tell you, I checked very often for, I think, 80% of the symptoms. Yeah. So let's, let's just stop and give you some credit for being the hero that you are. You're an ADHD female who you've always had it, right? You're smart and you're hardworking and you just did it. So really, you're a hero because it was harder for you to work 
to get to do the same amount of work as a neurotypical. Okay, and, and I really want your listeners just to sit with that. Um, it would be the equivalent of um, those of us with ADHD being born missing half a leg, and the whole purpose of life is to run a race. Well, we can run that race, but how the race is defined right now in our world, missing half a leg is a serious impediment. So what you did was heroic. You did it. You're, you're pushing forward. And no, it wasn't always glamorous looking, but guess what? You kept pushing forward, right? So your question was, should everyone get tested? Only if it's going to help you. I, I personally believe knowing is better. So for me, in my little tiny world, I'm like, hey, listen, the more I know, the more I can like account for different variables and understand it and move forward. Um, if it helps you kind of put a framework around, oh, dang, that's why I always forget where I park my car. I'm not stupid. I just have a short-term memory issue. Then please get diagnosed. If you're just kind of plotting through life and your son was diagnosed, but you're like, hey, listen, I kind of have my life managed, even though I probably have it, you don't have to get diagnosed. If life is too hard, and if you're like constantly angry at yourself or you're not living up to your own expectations, uh, that's when I would start to ask the question and seek a diagnosis. Because that'll probably help guide treatments and medications and everything else. Yes. And it's really just nice to know you're not an idiot. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, that's how I felt. I just felt like always a day late, dollar short. And why couldn't I just do the easy things in life? Like for me, managing a calendar, wow, that's like the hardest math I could ever imagine. And yet I do things much more complicated in my life than that. But it's the simple things that are constantly wearing me down. Okay. And so knowing I have ADHD really helps put that in perspective. This has been amazing. Like you're truly an incredible person. Your book is great. I highly recommend. It's Your Brain's Not Broken. I'll have a link in the show notes. I highly recommend people read it, but I do want to end with what are your closing thoughts? Like, I don't know if it's for a neurotypical who has experience with those with ADHD, maybe a message for them and maybe a message for those who suspect or do have ADHD. So first for the ADHD listener, uh, you're not broken. Your brain does work differently. And so I really want to encourage you uh, to stop trying to pretend you're normal, find the way you work, and then just work it out. In other words, I carry a book. It's old school, but I carry a book with me, and it acts as my external hard drive. That's not the right way to do things. That's not the wrong way. It's just the way I need to do things. So for the ADHD person, just really be brave and start to figure out what do I need to do that works. Uh, to the neurotypical person, I get it. We're a handful. And you know what? Sometimes we can look like a hot mess. And uh, many of us are just doing the best we know how. So don't try to fix it for us. Don't try to rescue us. Don't judge us. Just walk, walk beside us. And, you know, if we do ask for help, Lend us a hand, but otherwise, just know we're really good at other things. And by the way, we're usually very funny people, so we're worth the trip a lot of times. <laughs> I'm laughing actually. Can I just say that one of my bosses was um, speaking to my ex husband, and he was like, "That Georgie, I'm telling you, but she's so worth it." <laughs> and I was like, "Yep, there you go." And also coaching. Do you do telehealth visit coaching or is it all in person? Because if people can call you, if you're okay with us saying they can call you, I'd love to share that as well. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm not taking new clients. Uh, I do work with some excellent coaches at the ADHD Center who are taking uh, new clients. Um, I'm also uh, the president of the ADHD Coaching Organization. And you can go there to look for uh, an ADHD coach. ADHD coaching is really highly effective uh, as a treatment for symptoms. Because once people can understand ADHD, then you can 
kind of make plans based on that understanding. Well, thank you so much. This was really fun. And I appreciate you going along with this conversation because um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure there's much more that we can discuss, but I think we've hit a lot of really important high points. And um, I do hope that listeners felt that we treated this with great respect while at the same time having our own fun teasing ourselves about uh, all the things that we've had to deal with. So um, I hope it was a good balance, Um, but thank you so much. And I wish you all the best. And uh, for your next book, you should contact me and maybe we can have another discussion. I would love it. I love the work that you do. Thank you for tuning in to this discussion on the FemPower Health podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to information that is referred to in this episode. And if you like this episode and found it timely and valuable, please take a moment to tell a friend or a colleague about FemPower Health. And right after this episode is over, please think of one person who might find this episode helpful and tell them about it. And if your friend is new to podcasting, please show them how to subscribe to our show. And another way to support FemPower Health Podcast is to leave a review where you listen to podcasts. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for information purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health Podcast guests are their own and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. See you next week. Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of FemPower Health. No matter where you are in your journey, our website is brimming with content tailored to your specific topic of interest or life stage. Dive in and discover the resources and insights waiting for you. Your voice matters to us. And if you found value in this episode, please take a moment to write a review. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but it also helps others discover our podcast. By spreading the word, you're empowering women everywhere with the information they need to navigate their unique health journeys. And if this episode resonated with you, please don't keep it a secret. Share it with friends, loved ones, or anyone you believe would benefit from the information. Together, we can create a world where every woman feels supported, informed, and empowered. Remember, knowledge is power, and FemPower Health is here to guide you and support you in every step of the way. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for informational purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Until next time.